Jim Muir, and welcome to Washington Business Report. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So you're here in Washington, and it's a city now where you have a very big name because of what's coming at National Harbor. Plus, 2013 was just a great year for your company overall. Talk to us about the year that you've had. Well, it's hard to believe it was so good after the recession and how bad it all was back in 2009 and 10. But yes, we had a record year uh, in uh, China, in our MGM Macau property. We had a record year at City Center, our big, beautiful new development in Las Vegas. And we had two big wins at the end of last year. We won the opportunity to build on the banks of the Potomac and also the opportunity to build in Massachusetts. So we're pretty fired up about 2014 and uh, I think we're going to see better days even ahead. So you used to be the guy on Wall Street, the analyst who would bet on companies and try and gauge which companies were uh, going to succeed and which ones were going to fail. Mm -hmm. Would you have bet on MGM having uh, this kind of a turnaround given how tough things were during the recession? Uh, no one was betting on us back in 2009. Uh, it looked like uh, the perfect storm of problems. We had banks that wouldn't call me back. We had a partner that wasn't happy with us. We had 10,000 construction workers working on the largest project in the United States. Uh, when the equity markets had dry, uh, dried up. And we had fewer people visiting Las Vegas because they just didn't have the money or the means to do so. So it was a horrendous time. And uh, our stock went from 100 to 2. So it gives you a sense of everyone betting against us. We had to do really heroic efforts uh, uh, through the courage of a lot of men and women at MGM to get to where we are today. I didn't really know how it was going to end up. Had I known, I would have enjoyed the intellectual process of learning as much as I did, but I knew we couldn't give up, and that was really the, the message then. And now we're, uh, I think, a symbol of the resiliency of a group of people that just wouldn't give up and give in. Were there any key turning moments, turning points when you felt like, okay, this is where we're turning the corner, or was it just sticking it out in a period of time before you realized it was going to be okay? Well, I learned uh, that you have to buy time. You might not have all the answers today, but if you could buy time and, and relationships matter. So the fact that we had very strong bank relationships, I was kind of kidding that some of the banks did call me back. Um, but just a few. Just a few because others were owned by the Queen in, in England and, uh, and there were some pretty big distractions going on in the world. But we had strong enough bank relationships that the banks gave us some time uh, through forbearance agreements, uh, through extensions of credit, uh, to sort through, th through some issues. That was number one. Number two was uh, our, our employees themselves uh, showed a great amount of courage, and, and that's what really is seared in my mind, because let's, let's face it, you know, no one has to visit any of our resorts, and we're not curing cancer. Uh, we're not feeding the homeless directly, indirectly, uh, we do. Um, but people go to Las Vegas or other resorts to have a good time. They reconnect with their family, their friends, do business. And if they have a bad experience, it, you know, they're just not going to come back. And if they have a bad experience, it's because of those em employees that have not created that kind of experience for them. So the fact that we had uh, great employees, the fact that we bought ourselves a little bit of time, and the fact that the banks gave us uh, a little bit of uh, leeway was the reasons why we got out of this mess. So as you said, record quarters for both MGM China and City Center. And winning the Maryland competition, uh, you are a person who's seen as the kind of CEO that likes to engage rather than do battle. But you had to do battle in Maryland. What did you learn from that experience? What was it like fighting and then winning? Uh, yes, we're, we, we're, not a, we're, we're not fighters by nature. Uh, we're more collaborators, but uh, we were attacked. Uh, we were attacked uh, in a PR campaign that uh, spread a lot of misinformation about our company. And uh, I feel like that was an attack on all the 62,000 employees of our company. So we just, uh, we fought back with facts. And um, I think the reason why we won was that the people in Maryland not necessarily said, we want MGM a casino company, but they liked what we stood for. They liked the kind of employer that we are, the kind of work we do uh, for, for minorities and women, the kind of work we do in terms of the sustainable design development operation. And I think we got a sense of the people that said, I think this could be a good employer for our, our, for our state and a good community partner. And it was, a, it was a tough battle, it was an expensive battle, but the stakes were very high. Uh, when we opened MGM at National Harbor, 
we're going to employ 4,000 men and women, uh, 4,000 men and women primarily from Prince George's County, a county that can certainly use the jobs and the economic uh, stimulation, and it's going to be beautiful. I think it's going to be something that Maryland will be proud of. I know I'll be proud of it. It'll be something for the Mid-Atlantic region, and I think it's going to be the most successful casino outside of Las Vegas from a profitability perspective. So I, I guess the fight was worth it. You have really stressed uh, under your leadership that MGM isn't just about casinos and gambling, but hospitality. Uh, City Plaza, uh, City Center in Las Vegas that you built, really uh, a lot of people were very dubious about this whole idea of an outdoor urban plaza that could be just a nice place for people to go. You're stressing wellness at your hotels and juice fasts, uh, juice fasts in the Las Vegas of all places. So describe to us the experience in Maryland beyond gambling and casinos. What will MGM bring to National Harbor? Well, it'll be a landmark resort. It'll be beautiful, it'll be very uh, contemporary, but understated. It'll have a very uh, sleek, knife-like tower and uh, I, I think a, a, a very beautiful podium. There'll be a lot of embracement of the natural beauty of uh, Maryland and the region. So we'll have indoor uh, conservatories, but we'll also have outdoor parks where people can meander and, and explore uh, throughout the four seasons. So cherry blossoms in, in the spring and, and having great evergreens and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, inside out type of experiences. We are an entertainment company, so we're going to dial up the entertainment quite a bit for Prince George. It's a big theater, a lot of outdoor events, and it'll have a luxury hotel. And I heard of, from a lot of ladies in uh, Prince George's that they don't have enough retail, particularly high-end retail. They've got to go to Virginia or Montgomery County or, or someplace out of P uh, Prince George's County. So, you know, we have the best retail relationships in the world. Of and lots of retailers. spa services coming. And lots of spa services, yes. You have a personal connection to Maryland. Tell us about that. Well, I got married in Baltimore. My wife's from Baltimore, and I was married 24 years ago in, in the city. My wife is on the board of Johns Hopkins. Uh, my son goes to Johns Hopkins. Uh, I have been to probably every great crab place uh, and, and tried every great crab cake, uh, which I adore. I just love being there. So it's a matter of being with family. I have friends. I have a son there at school. We're very. It active. can't hurt the son who's a freshman in college that he's going to be able to say to his friends like, "Hey, you want to head to National Harbor? Check out my dad's new company, new business." Well, that, that's not going to that's not going to help him either because he knows I'm going to be more uh, more strict on him than any other guest of our uh, our resort. <laughs> we'll keep an eye out for him. So, talk a little bit more about your leadership style. Uh, you are seen as a collaborator, a team builder. Uh, tell us more about how you would describe your leadership style. Well. I, I, I was very active in athletics, so I, I look at it uh, as an athletic team uh, environment, uh, and I, I outwork almost anybody. So I learned early on on Wall Street that I wasn't the smartest guy in the room, um, and so I, I just had to work harder, and I value that. And I think the employees of our company know that uh, I'm not going to ask them to do anything I haven't done or won't do or work as hard as anyone else, and that's number one. Number two. Uh, I'm a majority-minority company, so the majority of my employees are minorities. If I don't invest in the employees of our company, I'm failing them. And so I think by showing uh, that we care about our employees and in investing in their wellness, investing in nutrition and in health care and workplace environments and to be inclusive regardless of somebody's gender or race or religion or sexual preference. Um, I think that's important, and it's something that's important to me. So I view myself as a team player. Um, I view myself as somebody that had to work for what I, I've, I've received, and I work hard. Uh, but I view myself also as somebody that celebrates the successes of others, and uh, I'm really proud of my company, and uh, I love working there, and uh, I, I hope it shows. You've won awards for being one of the most uh, engaged workplaces in the U.S. Um, so what does that take? How do you engage an employee and make them care about where they work? Well, employees are very logically suspicious and, and uh, a little bit uh, tentative about the relationships they can have with employers. Um, and employers sometimes make the mistake of saying, hey, we're all one big happy family. That doesn't resonate with employees. Their family is at home. But the idea of a team, that does resonate. So if you invest in particular programs and show that you care 
about their nutrition, about their family's health, about the workplace environment. Um, you start over time, and this is a evolutionary process, to get that buy-in with employees. And it's all about communication, two-way communication. And uh, we've been very innovative in this. In fact, we decided that uh, we're in the entertainment business, so how do we get our ideas, our core values of teamwork and integrity and excellence out to our employees? How do we convey uh, the importance of the environment and, and diversity and inclusion and being involved in communities? And we said, well, let's, let's put on a show. So we did. It's called Inspire in Our World. And we brought together all of our employees over multiple days and did a Broadway-style production show that was written by MGM employees, performed by MGM employees, and it's been so successful that other organizations said, you know, can we see the show? So we've been here in D.C. at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We've, had, we've been at the Red Cross. We've been up in New York. At do a, you a, sing and dance? I do not. <laughs> I, I, Probably the best way the to keep them engaged is promise. for you not to do this. I, I, I said, look, I'll give you all the money you need <laughs> to put on the show, but don't make me sing. It's not pretty. Um, but I, I do participate in the show. It's important. So when you were the analyst, you were the guy paid to think of ways that the CEO could be doing his or her job better. Mm -hmm. You took over as CEO at MGM at the most difficult time, mm -hmm. right at the height of the recession. Um, the, the company took a big hit. Yeah. What did you learn the hard way that's more difficult about being a CEO than you ever imagined? On Wall Street, I was paid uh, to make pronouncements, give opinions. And uh, Wall Street's not particularly good at uh, employee, employer loyalty. Um, I was there for 14 years, and I was one of the rare people that actually stayed at the same company. Now, my company got acquired a couple times, but I, I stayed in the same spot. Most of my coworkers would jump from job to job for 10% more money or a better office or just, you know, the grass is greener. And uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I brought that idea of, of being an employee to Las Vegas back in 1998. And I learned quickly that it's not about the individual, it's about the collective of the company itself. And so one thing that I, it took me 10 years, I think, to, to grow through that process. By the time I became the CEO in 2008, I recognized that um, I couldn't be successful individually if the people around me were not successful. And I think that was the big difference maker. I had built some credibility in being at the company for 10 years. People knew I worked pretty hard. And I, the financial background, I, I probably was the right guy for the, that, that particular time and place because of my personal relationships on Wall Street. I think that, that helped us a little bit through the recession. But what was most important uh, to me at the time and why I'm so proud today is that uh, people were willing to give it a chance. I mean, think about how bad it's, it's it might, might be hard for some people watching your show to remember how bad it was, but we had 18% unemployment in Las Vegas. We were laying off thousands upon thousands of people. People were losing their homes, losing and their And had cars, no home equity value. No home equity. They're underwater, and yet they were showing up to work every day, and they were taking care of customers. They were putting their own personal uh, challenges aside to have that connection with a customer. That is, is much, I think, uh, an example of courage as somebody running into a burning building and, and, and saving somebody. I really believe that because without that, 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 that incredible strength, uh, we would have, all would have been lost. And so I take that message with me every day. It's a new day here in 2014. We're doing well as a company. We're hiring. We'll be hiring 4,000 people here in, the, in this area over the next couple of years, another 3,000 people in Massachusetts, 7,000 more in, uh, in Macau when we open up a brand new property there, and a couple thousand more in Las Vegas as we continue to expand. So it, it's getting fun again, but uh, it would be easy for some people to forget. I will never forget. The scars are going to be with me all my life, to, to, and I'm trying to prevent that type of vulnerability in the future. Can you uh, show us the two bands you're wearing and tell us why you wear those? Oh. Well, um, yes. Uh, I'm an Irish Catholic guy from Connecticut, uh, and unfortunately there's an awful lot of cancer in my family, so uh, melanoma. So my father died very young um, of melanoma. My brother was one of his doctors at the time. My brother was the, ran the Yale Cancer Center, uh, a 
one of the top oncologists in the country. He, my wife, and I started a cancer center in Las Vegas. That's the, that's the we used to be red. It's a little faded now. Um, and uh, ironically and tragically, my brother died right after we opened up the cancer center back in 2005. Of so, cancer. Of cancer, melanoma. So, my brother felt, you know, that I was the the guy that. That kind of sold out to Wall Street because he was the <laughs> older brother, the doctor, the great academic. That's what brother, older brothers are supposed yeah, to yeah, say. Like, and, and so, in, in his message to all of us was improve the world. Just that was, just distilled it down to a very simple message: just try to improve the world. And when he died, my other brother um, made the the white band. So one's about the Cancer Institute, the other is about uh, the memory of my brother and what he stood for, and what I try to do in my my own life. And how did that change you in terms of, if it did in any way, you've always been a family man, how did it change you as a CEO who was so focused on business and trying to find that work-life balance? Well, my wife uh, uh, is smarter than I am, uh, and she's gorgeous, and uh, she was a big shot on Wall Street. So she ran global consumer products research at Merrill Lynch. She was a, a, a top-rated analyst for a long, long time. And our kids realized, we have two boys, young men now, they're bigger than I am. They saw both their parents working very, very hard. Um, and I think uh, that is a good thing. Um, I think that our, our, our kids saw that their parents worked hard and cared a lot about them um, and tried to balance that uh, hard work with uh, bringing up um, a, a family in a responsible way. And I'm really proud of my sons. I think they're proud of their parents. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind, uh, there's no substitute for being there, showing up and putting in the effort. And I don't care if you work, not work. Um, I, I, I do not ascribe to the theory that you have to be home with your kids every single day uh, to be a parent. Um, you put in the time, uh, they'll understand it. And so we are very flexible employers. At MGM, uh, we understand that every situation at home is different. Uh, we are a tremendous advocate of workplace flexibility and providing opportunities. We have a lot of single parent uh, families, um, and uh, these are men and women that are balancing a, a family life with working 40, 50, 60 hours a week and trying to figure out how to deal with childcare uh, and getting their kids to the doctor. And, and we so we spent a lot of time on that. I think that's why our, our employee retention levels are so much higher than our competitors. Our, our turnover rates are so much lower, lower. It's not that we pay more, we pay at the upper end of the range, but it's all the, the opportunities that our employees have uh, to, to run their lives in the, in the way that they see fit. Um, that's why we spend so much time on CSR. At the board level, uh, Secretary Alexis Corporate Sermon. social responsibility. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have yeah. mentioned it, yes. No, so the, you, you've been recognized for that as well, being very involved in that area. And hired Alexis Herman, the former labor secretary in Washington. Yes. For that position as well. She is, uh, she, she rides a, a tough ship. She tells us what's what, and uh, she's one of my best board members. And we are innovators on diversity and inclusion and on sustainable design. That project we mentioned, City Center, the one that we were struggling to open, uh, fast forward to today, it's the largest green project uh, in North America. It received uh, the most awards of any project that has ever been built in the United States um, for uh, green design and development. And it was her, le her, her imprint on that and the commitment of our board that, that takes us there. So, for example, at National Harbor, uh, we're going to build uh, to the gold level of the U.S. Green Building Council. That's the highest level you could build of a project this size. It'll be a, a green project, and, and uh, it's everywhere we build. In fact, I insist that we do that. And just lastly, uh, when you check your family into National Harbor, what are you most looking forward to doing first when you check into it, that new <sighs> entertainment center? Well, I'm going to go up uh, to the, the, the top floor and I'm going to look at the nation's capital, uh, and I'm going to see all the monuments. Um, and then, by the way, if you're here, you'll be able to see the tower of MGM, um, and that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, and then I'm going to go downstairs and walk the floor and see all the great restaurants that we're having of local cuisine, and uh, I think we're going to see some smiling people. And uh, I've got a lot of women that, are, uh, that I've made promises to on the retail and on the spa, so I'll make sure that we hit that one out got of the park. And will you serve crab cakes? Oh, the best. <laughs>
Jim Murr, and thanks for work, talking to us on Washington Business Report. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks.